focusing you in on this small screen, whether it's a pad or a tab or a board, as Mark Weiser called it in the 80s. This is a small world. This is the idea of the desktop computer. When we were in the desktop era, you could sit in front of a computer. It had battery life, it had bandwidth, it had high resolution, and you had focus. Suddenly, when we started taking these out of our houses and into our pockets and having portable desktop computers, it doesn't work. You can't be sitting there in your car with your phone like this because you forget what's going on around you. Cars were built with peripheral attention in mind. They even have a foot pedal. You don't have to look at the pedal. You don't have to look at the accelerator. You don't have to push a button on a touch screen to accelerate the car. It uses more of you. Everything is about keeping your primary focus on the road and you glance up and back in order to get that information. What technology in your life allows you to get information with a glance without getting all of your attention taken away? So, this is about informing and encalming at the same time. You can add information into the environment in an in ambient awareness kind of way. A silly example is this idea of a weather-based light bulb. So this is my, my old house in Portland, Oregon, and it usually rains in Portland, but every once in a while it's sunny. So my old co-founder and I made this light bulb that changes color based on what the weather will be for the day. So instead of these very pristine looking videos where a single San Franciscan guy with a perfect English accent, a perfect American English accent, wakes up in the morning and gets a disembodied voice telling him what the weather is going to be, which nobody wants, you walk into the kitchen, which means you're kind of awake, and you can feel, based on the temperature, the light temperature, what it will be like that day. Very least amount of tech, weather report, I walked into my kitchen this morning, the light was yellow, I knew it would be sunny. Most of the time I walk into the kitchen, the light is blue, I know it's going to be rainy. If I want higher resolution information, I can look at the iPad that I installed on the wall. It's totally not necessary. But you can get a feeling, a human feeling of something before you get the high resolution information. It's not being thrown at you. You have a choice whether you want more. And I think that choice is really important. How many things can you do? If you're a developer, maybe you could put the status of your servers in lights around the wall so that everybody understands. But you don't have to read anything. There's no audio telling you something. So this is a really important thing to remember as we try to automate. Every time we try to make a computer that acts like a human, we end up making humans act like a computer. We end up having humans on pause. Every time I have a voice interface that I'm trained culturally in a movie that I can talk to a computer, right? We always see this, you can talk to a computer in a movie. But the way that somebody understands, the way that a computer understands a human voice is not the same. And so even though it speaks in a human voice, we expect to be able to speak to it at the same level. And yet when we do, we often have to repeat ourselves. We are the ones that sound like a robot you find a five-year-old kid that's really good at Amazon Alexa, and they're often saying this robotic voice, very articulate. The original idea, one of the original ideas of, of cybernetics, is that we go back to the original idea of technology, which is tool use. You are using a tool alongside you to get something done, to go further with something. Google doesn't make the decision for you uses robots to scrape through all sorts of information, and it gives you a choice. It's doing 80%, 90% of the work for you, but you're the one that's making the decision. A recommendation system is different from the computer making the decision for you. This is why Amazon works. It's giving you recommendations. It's not telling you what you should buy. There are some things that we should absolutely automate. Like, if we're going to continue to mine resources, we should have robots do that. It's very dangerous for humans to do that. This is my friend Todd Huffman, and he was upset because grad students and postdocs were in labs taking tissue samples, and it was very time-consuming. It hurt your eyes, it hurt your wrists. And instead of doing interesting work about solving cancer and doing experiments, they were scanning tissues, preparing slides and scanning tissues. So he made a robot that would 
take a three-dimensional tissue sample, cut it, scan it while it cut, and then upload it to a database. And the most important thing about the database is it's not an AI that's determining what, if it's going to be cancer or not. It's a doctor that votes on when it became cancerous or not, what kind of cancer it was, and then everybody can see that. So because it's a human plus a machine working side by side in a feedback loop, it's stronger than simply an AI or a single human doctor. It's this network. And I think that's an important thing to remember that we think that we can make an AI that's better than us, and that's often because of film. But we need to realize that AI is its own species, like a dog. We wouldn't want a dog to be human. We recognize that dogs are different. We still work with them and work alongside them. AI thinks its own weird way. Let's let it think that way and figure out how to work alongside it and let it amplify the best part of that so that we can add ourselves over here. Gary Kasparov, the chess champion, talks about the concept of a centaur that a mediocre chess player with a good system can outperform an expert chess player. And I think we have to remember that, that we don't have to be perfect at everything, but with good systems, we can do a good job as long as we still have human autonomy and we see what the system is doing. A lot of automation amplifies and keeps the kind of institutionalized racism, whatever, whoever has the bias, it propagates it through. So we, have to out, we, we can't have them be copyrighted. We have to see the data that they're working with. Otherwise, it could be bias, and we could just trust it blindly. Because it's humans building these machines. And we have to remember that everything is still being built by humans, even if it's somebody programming an AI. The human who programmed it is going to propagate that all the way through. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. We don't want everything to speak at us. It's really annoying. It interrupts us. This is why I like the Roomba vacuum cleaner, at least the early one. This is not a very good vacuum. It doesn't clean the corners. It's kind of slow. It stumbles around. But when it's done, it goes dun 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 dun. And when it's stuck, it goes dun dun. These are human universal tones. A two-year-old can understand them. You don't have to translate this into a bunch of different languages to, under to have somebody understand that the vacuum is done or it's stuck. And remember those pocket pets, the little Tamagotchis? So these were so special because they weren't very good. There's this little creature that needed your help. It would die if you didn't press a button and feed it. We loved them because we had to take care of them. We love the Roomba because it's not very smart. We have to take care of it. Because the assumption is that you don't have a perfect device, you make something that's not perfect, and we find it cute, and we help it out. When we help something out, we become bonded to it. And also, if we think about Star Wars, C-3PO might know two million languages, but he's annoying in every single one of those languages. R2-D2 beeps, and we have no idea what R2 is saying, but we think he's super adorable, right? So the tonal stuff, the tonal design is often much more successful because if you make something in any specific language, you can't export it to another country unless you translate it. That's why at the beginning of a lot of Pixar films, we have the silent film, and it's, so, it's always about a human universal. It's always about something that never changes. People ask about, how do you keep up with technology? And I say, you don't need to. You just always think about what will always be true for 5,000 years. We'll still have hammers. We'll still need to get something done. How do we design with the least amount of tech to solve the problem? Every single new feature has to be maintained. Every new code base has to be believed in, especially if it's open source. People like to move around. I like the programming language COBOL because it's still running most of the ATMs in the world and a lot of the flight software. It was made as a system that couldn't fail. And so it's very hard to work with, but it doesn't need to be updated a lot. We make a lot of software right now that has to be updated all the time. When we released it for CD-ROM and you had to mail out a CD-ROM every two years, you really had to make sure it was good because you could, you could not go to everyone's house and say, sorry, we have to do an update. You had to be really diligent about finishing something. I like streetlights because they're like a punctuation for reality. 
They're also universal. Everywhere in the world has a street light. You can go anywhere and understand what the street is trying to tell you. And the toilet occupied sign on the airplane is useful. You don't need augmented reality glasses to see it. You don't need a thousand dollar headset and a Wi-Fi connection. You just have an icon. It's universal, even if you're red, green, colorblind. These are boring technologies, but they're successful. And if we look at the early era, the original apps were home appliances that did save our time. They sat in a corner, we could press a button, they did stuff for us. How do we make tech like that? That's around and we can do something that always works? Like electricity. We don't have to Wi-Fi access the electricity. If we had electricity today like we did the web, the electricity in here would be all over the place. Sorry, you can't turn on the light switch. There's not enough network available for your light switch. The whole point of electricity was to be invisible. And if you're an electrician, you have to be certified to work with electricity. It's dangerous. Maybe we should say the same thing about code. Code is dangerous. It can kill people. It can cause people to commit suicide if you poke at them long enough with a bad social network message. It can cause people to attack others. It can cause people to do all sorts of things. Maybe we should treat it like electricity. Right now, most of what we use online is far away. In the desktop era, everything was close. You didn't need network access. You could make your Word document and print it and bring it into school. So we didn't have the distractions. Maybe you played some video games. And maybe this is a complicated graph, but the idea is that early on, computers were far away from you. Then the desktop brought all your information close and your computers close. Now we have devices in our pockets, but we're using information that's far away. Maybe we can have something in the middle. All of your health information is with you, and when you take it to a doctor, they can make a diagnosis, add the information to your file, and you can take it home with you. That way, when somebody hacks into the medical database, they only get what's shared for the last 30 minutes, not everybody's information. And I think this is important that every company will be hacked, that everything is insecure. And if we assume that everything's insecure, we can change how we build things. Because every company needs to be able to work on the same thing, getting something done, but they can't be a security expert at the same time. And storing everything in the cloud is just too exciting for hackers. It's too easy to hack into everything. And with that said, it's really important that in the past, you could have a radio or a television repair person down the street. Kids would learn how to build things, become electrical engineers by taking apart the family television set, and then the parents would get mad. They'd have to put it back together and learn about it. They'd go get a job at a repair shop. Things were simple enough that you could take apart your car. You could fix your sewing machine. You could learn how to sew. You could learn how to cook. Everything was about this small individual thing. You could have a hobby. You could build a model train. You could build a plane. You could build a boat. You could build your house. You could be a contractor. You could nail something to a wall. Now, how much of the things that we use can we actually maintain or build ourselves? Do we see any depth anymore? Are we adding our imaginations to anything? I feel that there's a kind of disconnect that makes us, there's, a, there's like a French word, me, that maybe you're not entirely connected to things anymore. And I think this is a problem. So if good design allows you to get you to your goal in the least amount of moves, and a very good designer, maybe even a furniture designer, tries to take away those steps until there's nothing left to take away, and then a calm technology does the same thing, allows you to accomplish the same goals with the least amount of mental cost. Because, as Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown and everybody might agree with, isn't a person's primary task to be a human? To be able to have time to watch a sunset? Are we really living if all of our free time is taken up by notifications? Do you remember your last internet binge? Or do you remember the last time you read a good book? or wrote a journal that was for you and not for Instagram. Because the scariest resource is not technology. Technology is cheap. It's our attention and what we do with it. 
we don't have that long to live, what are you actually doing with your life? I got mad that Mark Weiser died and that nobody remembered Calm Technology, so I wrote a whole book on it for designers, and then I realized that sound and beeps and alarms are terrible, so I wrote a book on how to make them slightly better. Um, I also uploaded all these papers and research on calmtech.com. I would encourage you to read them. There's a great paper called The Technologist's Responsibility. Uh, it's about ethics, privacy, location tracking. It was written in, the, in 1989, I think, or 1991. It's the same thing as today. Nothing changes. So let's think about what really matters. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Amber, por ser parte de Congreso Futuro 2019. Los invitamos a seguir participando de nuestro próximo panel, Humanos y Máquina, una dupla poderosa. <risa>